All right, now most of you have a pencil, so I'm hoping that right now you can write down what you think the ultimate challenge is for transition in the next 20 years. Transition. The next 20 years, so Cayenne here is going to be 40. I might be winding it down a bit, but I doubt it. Right. Transition. What is the ultimate challenge today? How many of you said something like this? How many of you said, uh, we really need to figure out cycle engineering? Because look at that cycle wave, boom, into a, <laughs> into a pole. Um, yeah, how many of you said traffic? Streets, no? Okay. Well, if we're gonna go from 3% cycling to 50% cycling, which is basically the transition path for the next 20 years, it's gonna be a big change. We're gonna to have to figure that one out. How many of you said this? How many of you said something like environment, uh, agriculture? Okay, we got one on there. How many of you said 50% fewer cows? Because that's actually the nature of that challenge of managing the environment through a transition to clean water again. How many of you said something about population? All right, I got a couple of those. How many of you said uh, managing that tw uh, two billion person decline in population? Because that's pretty much the, the transition for the next couple of years, is from, it, it is from the, the, the pattern of growth to, to the pattern of um, population slowdown and decline. How about energy? How many of you said something about oil? All right, we got a couple of those, yes. And how many of you said, managing on 50% less fuel overall. And for things like personal transport, probably no oil for that. We, we got that, because that's the transition over the next 20 years. All right, so let me tell you a story. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about um, a little story that uh, I heard for the first time when I was a, an undergraduate at University of Colorado Boulder from Professor Albert Bartlett. Um, it's a little, practice in mathematics, right? That, that at nine o'clock in the morning, I put one bacteria in a jar full of food, bacteria doubles every minute. I can tell you from experience that at noon, the jar is full. So at what point is that jar half full? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock. There we go, one minute before noon. And in 1983, when I first heard that lecture from, from Professor Bartlett, um, it got me to, <laughs> and he says this is, you know, he's passed away now, but, but he, he says this is the challenge for us, the ultimate challenge, is to understand that very simple question, that for three hours, there was no problem, and then in the last minute, there was no hope. And yet with simple math, we can understand that, <laughs> right? <coughs> so was, did anybody write down resources as the ultimate challenge? And in the context of resources, the next 20 years, the transition is the end of growth. That way of thinking has been patterned on us because of the three hours that we've had, not because of the reality of our situation. <laughs> All right. Um, let, me, let me tell you another story about the great global experiment on what happens if you take a solid and you react it with a, with a gas and then you release it into an atmosphere. <laughs> and we have a model for how that might work and then we have um, the data that we've taken and that fits a very nice um, linear trend. And so therefore we can figure out that 100 gigatons of solid fossil carbon um, burned with oxygen from the atmosphere raises the parts per million in the atmosphere by, by 20 parts per million. And there's a lot of complexity in that because there's lots of things happening in that system. But that experiment pretty much speaks for itself. So, I'm going to tell you about a system. And this system is very useful. I'm going to use a bridge. It's got, it's got a lot of complexity, it's got different parts, it's got different materials, it's got different loadings on different parts, and it's, and, and it's been put together different ways. It's got some safety features, it's got some lighting. It does all sorts of useful things that most of us take for granted most of the time. We just use it, don't think about it too much. And what we know about it, looking at it, is that it has a safe load limit. It does indeed. 
And if we push it past that, we all know what a safe load limit means, don't we? It's like, don't do that, right? So for a lot of generations, really, for um, probably what looks like maybe eight generations of my family, people didn't worry about it very much because we weren't even anywhere near that safe load limit. And then about the time that I was born in the 1960s, we had loaded it up a bit, up to 310 parts per million. And by the time I graduated from high school, we had, uh, we had loaded it up some more. And when I went into engineering as a freshman back in the 80s, um, I went into it for that reason, because it looked to me like it was time to do something about that. <laughs> this is looking pretty dangerous, you know? Uh, the science is, is pretty clear that we're changing things and that the rate at which we're doing it now is pretty impressive. So from then till now, we've, we've been quite impressive. And yes, we've exceeded that safety limit. And yes, we have changed that system. And I can't tell you exactly what we've done to it. I can't tell you exactly whether it's a spiral fracture of a column or whether it's an undermining of a foundation or whether it's just now more susceptible than it used to be to things. I can't tell you exactly, and neither can anybody else, but I can tell you what you've done. And it's done now. And it's not a problem of the future anymore. It's done. So what's our next trick, really? <clears throat> you know, If we can't communicate through telling you what a safe limit is, then what should we do next? Well, how about we tell you about the, the load to failure? Would you get that? <laughs> well, really, we mean don't do this, OK? Really, don't do this. And at the rate we are doing it without even speeding up anymore, which seems to be what we quite like to do, um, we're actually going to do it by the, before a child born now graduates from high school. Probably before I even get grandkids. <laughs> we will have done what's, what's rather an unthinkable thing to do. We will have broken that. And it won't work anymore for what we want to do with it. All right? Um, and so at this point, with only a few years left, and roaring that last truck on, um, fossil carbon production moratorium is a rational response. That is what the transition is. It's leaving that stuff in the ground. We can always change our minds later and go get it out. Couldn't we? It's not an irreversible decision. Putting it in the air is irreversible. That one we can't do. And for our last trick, <laughs> that's the amount of fossil carbon that we already have licenses to put in the air. Okay? So there's a little bit of, of a sort of unthinkability there that, you know, you, you, you think to yourself, well, well, that can't be, right? Somebody would do something. Uh, it, I, just, I just don't get that. And yet, that's just the numbers that, that are. That's without going up into the Arctic to get more. That's without fracking any more. That's the stuff we already know where it is, and we're already committed to getting it out. So that's an interesting thing. How many of you put down something like this for your ultimate challenge, right? How many of you put down um, climate change? Maybe the challenge of the transition over the next 20 years of getting back down to 1990 levels, like we said we would before. Didn't do it, but you know now we'll do it. Did we put that down, climate change? No? Well, OK. <laughs> sort of thought somebody would. But what I'll tell you is that those 1990 levels uh, get not only the last truck on the bridge, but a good chunk of, of, the, of the big one, all right? So not even that, that thing that we couldn't do before, not even that is gonna do it. So let me tell you a little story. You remember that, that big meteor that hit Russia recently? And then there was a near miss that swung by and, and, and you're thinking, well, that's interesting, right? And NASA's like, well, that's okay. We're tracking them out there, you know, we're watching them. Well, a meeting of scientists from all, all you know, from all the countries, um, and the astronomers are looking, and they're like, yeah, we saw that one too. Yeah, did you see that one? Yeah, we saw that one. What does your model say? Yeah, that's what our model says too. Well, we need to figure out what we're gonna do about this. <laughs> because it's inside the solar system, we've been tracking it, we know where it's going, and we know it's a direct hit with the Earth, and we know that it's the big one, it's that one in a hundred million year one, right? There's, th it's a, it's a, that's it, right? And it's 20 years away. So 20 years from now, that's it. 
Um, what are we going to do about it? What? What are we going to do about it? Study it some more, maybe. I, I, no, I think what we should do <laughs> is, is we should think about actually doing something about it, right? We know how to put vehicles into space. We know how to drive them around out there. We know how to actually intercept comets. We've done it. You, you heard about that, right? They sent a probe and it took samples from a comet. This is a moving target. That's pretty cool. We can do that. And we've got lots of extra nuclear warheads. So surely we could do something to this thing. Now, we don't know what it is we could do because we don't know. So that means if we start right now and we launch whatever we can get up in, into space now, like within a year, then that goes out. The object is coming toward us. We send out. That means 10 years from now, we will find out something very important about this thing. Right? But only if we launch it now. So 10 years from now, we hit this thing with everything we can throw up in the next year. And we've got lots of probes looking at it, and it's closer, so we can see what's going on. We can see maybe, does it have some ice, or is it the iron that it looks like it is? Right? So, so we're going to throw that at it, and maybe we'll knock it off course. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll break it apart, but we won't know for 10 years. And then if we don't, we've got to have another one coming behind it. And we can learn from what we did, and we can give it another hit. And maybe we can see something more about it so we can you know, place that next one. And after a year of building that first one, we'll be better at it. And we'll, we'll build another one. And then the next year, we better have built another one, too. And the next one. So we've got 10 years, at least, of full-out you know, planetary-scale mobilization to try and stop this thing, to try and save the planet. And what we're pretty sure from everybody's agreement is that even if we throw everything we've got at this, something is still going to hit the planet. Or at least we can't say that it won't, right? We just don't know. So in 20 years, something massive is going to happen. So it's not just the extraterrestrial problem we have to think about. It's here on this planet. We won't know where it's going to hit until right before it hits, you know, a year or so. So whatever we do now, we have to be thinking about mobility. Because somewhere on the planet, somebody's going to have to evacuate a very large region. And they're going to have to have somewhere to go. And if it's going to hit in the ocean, there's going to be tsunamis of a scale we can't understand. Okay? And then what it does to the planet, if it hits in the Sahara and throws up a whole bunch of sand, we could have quite a few years of no harvests. If it hits in the ocean, you know, other things could happen. It throws up a lot of moisture. So, so we know from paleontology that, that these things have happened in the past, and we know what they've done. So from now on, for 20 years, We've got to start planning for how we're going to survive that. Seeds, um, understand soils, get to planting the forest back so we have wood for fuel. You know, there's a heck of a lot of work to do. Um, and on top of that, in order to do this mobilization, if you look at it, the factories we've got to change over from cars, the, the massive project that we have, you know, like, like getting a man on the moon, that was a huge allocation of resources. A lot of people thought maybe we shouldn't do that. But it's like that, but times 500, right? So essentially, we're going to have to crash our economy. We're going to have to cut back our oil use, our material use, no more iPods. Those engineers who are now making cool computers, they got to be working on this. we got to gather up all the talent we've got. We've got to put it all into this. So the consumer economy, um, the use of oil to drive around, uh, Ratonga vacations, it's over, right? For the next 10 years, it's this or nothing. Because plan B is we don't tell people. Politicians, you know, they don't want to have to convince people of this. Uh, the, you know, the, the really rich people, they're going to stay rich. And they're going to reason that the, with their resources, they could probably build themselves an enclave to survive the big hit. And they'll probably get started on that. So for the next 20 years, we just go ahead and have a good time. And it'll be over quick. Plan B, which one? Which one should we do? And if we're going to do plan A, think about how hard that's going to be, right? Scientists, they don't know what they're talking about. I can't see it. You know, who can see it? It's just government people who can see it, right? And, and you know, this dinosaur thing, the Earth is only 6,000 years old anyway, so how, that can't be right. And they're just trying to find an excuse to take away our guns. Okay. You know, they want us to work together, be greenies or something. You know, it's not going to be pretty, this changing of the world in order to save it. 
is it going to work out? And what I'm telling you that I wrote down is that the ultimate challenge is facing what we fear most. This scenario of assured destruction, if we don't do everything we can right now, if we don't give up things, and, and is it giving up things? That's the question, because the more we talk about it, the more we understand that, well, you know, putting all of our thoughts into how to do this thing, that actually is a lot of jobs. <laughs> And putting our efforts into how to reorganize ourselves so that we're much more resilient, that, that's actually a lot of good work. So is it the end of the world to save the world? Is it really? And that's the ultimate question. Are we willing to do it? It's a hard question. And I'm answering it in a sort of interesting way that when you have a very large challenge, like aerospace, like electronics, like medical imaging, usually there's a, there's a, a type of engineering that, that sort of emerges to be able to do that. And transition engineering, looking forward, looking at the long term, and understanding what the end goal is, understanding what, it, what the mission is, what we have to do, understanding that so many people that share our community actually think we're going somewhere else. They think it's actually possible when it's not. So we have some communication issues. And we have to actually demonstrate the value of saving ourselves. <laughs> you know, most engineers, you don't have to do that. You go, look, cool widget. <laughs> You're done, right? Just got to sell it. This one, we've got to sell some more complicated things than that. But the process of doing it is actually doable. And I'm going to show you pretty quickly, without a whole lot of discussion, some of the projects that I work on. If this is going to happen at all, if we are going to have a transition that 20 years from now we haven't left it too late, that we did what we had to do right now and it worked out okay, the oil companies have to transition first. Who has that last truck? Who's going to do what with it? That's them. How can they make more money saving the planet than cooking it? Question of the day. Is it possible that by shutting down their deep sea drilling operations, it would, they would save a lot of money and still make the same money? Actually, yeah, that's true. Is it possible that by lowering their production, the price of oil would go up and they'd actually make more money? Oh yeah, that's kind of true. All right, transition the oil companies. How about transitioning cities? working on a big project in Christchurch right now. And it's not, it's not so much about vision or anything like that. It's about engineering. What do you change in a city right now to get the fabric of a city that was wiped out by the monoculture of personal vehicle design? How do you transform a city back into a human place, a productive place, an action place, a vibrant place? How do you do that and make money at it, right? And everybody's involved in it. That's a pretty good question. How about transitioning transportation? The end of the truck is in sight, right? If you're going to move goods around your country, you'd better have a good functioning rail system. How are we going to do that? It's all not how. That's not hard. We, we know how to do that. Choice, A or B. Which one's it going to be? <coughs> good question. Maybe, maybe modeling would help. Maybe showing how it will work. How about transitioning buildings? Again, we know how to do it. Maybe we don't know the business plan for how to do it. Maybe we don't have enough people in business um, actually practicing it. And maybe we need some better policy. But the house on the right has been retrofitted. The house on the left hasn't, or housing block. And you can see the difference. It's not hard to figure out how to do it. But this is what's hard. No new buildings. There isn't room for more buildings. Every building has an energy footprint and a resource footprint. I don't care if you told yourself it was zero something. But if you haven't taken out an old building, if you haven't replaced it with that good new building, then you've added to the problem no matter what it was you added. Okay? So everything is in the context of rebuilding, redeveloping what we've already done. That's what transition is. It's looking honestly at what we have already done, what we are doing, and changing that not dreaming about a new thing that we pile on top of the mess we've made. Land, yeah, a lot of that needs transitioned. Um, the way that we use agricultural land is um, not sustainable. That all needs to be rebuilt. 
And our, the way we use urban land is, is, is pretty far out there in, in what's going to be sustainable. It's not, it's not working very well, but that can be fixed. And while we're at it, there's so much land that's now paved. It's not doing anything. It's not producing anything. It's not a place for anyone to go. And it could be. With a little thinking and a little, a little design and a little bit of work. Right? So we transition our streets and we might even transition our roads. You all know that's the High Line in New York. Would anybody in New York now trade that transition for what was there before? And a little five minute drive on a, on a dirty old concrete road? I don't think so. Yeah, these transitions create value. They're different from what we're used to. They're not the last three hours of our existence. They're the last minute. But <laughs> if we don't get onto them, we won't have that last minute. And what am I doing? Well, I am indeed trying to form up, uh, and trying, we're working, it's working, <laughs> the uh, Global Association for Transition Engineering. And that includes anyone who wants to send the signal to the professional engineers of the world that this is their job. Just like safety engineering, this is your job. You built all this stuff. It's not working very good anymore. It's not serving us the way that we understood it would. It's threatening us and you need to fix it. And there isn't anybody else who's gonna fix it. Politicians can't fix it. The people who built it, who understand it, who understand what it costs to change it, who understand the value in the changes, who can show that to you, who can model it, who now have the means to do all that work, they have to get onto it. And right now, there's 330 of us worldwide. And safety engineering started with 60. And safety now is quite different than it was 100 years ago. It's now everywhere. You don't have to be a specialist in safety for it to benefit you. You don't have to have a dedicated safety engineer in your group for safety engineering to be saving lives in your factory. You don't have to have a dedicated safety engineering specialist in your family for your family to be safe in fires because of safety engineering, okay? We need these people. We need them to be thinking, be figuring out how to do all this. That's what we really need. And um, I've put down the tenets that uh, a group of us, when we met in, the, in uh, the UK last year, we decided on the tenets that are really important uh, for people who sign up to be to say, okay, I'm a chemical engineer right now, but I, I'm going to be a, a, t a transition engineer now. I'm going to prevent what's preventable. We share that with safety engineering. I'm going to never accept failure as the price of expediency. It's never cost effective to fail. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to to achieve this mission, um, and our mission really is singular. Everything else follows from it. We either do this or we don't. We either do everything we can to stop that object from reaching its target or we don't. And that target is 1,700 gigatons of fossil carbon stays in the ground. If you can face that idea, I know it's hard. It's really hard. You've got a long way to go before your brain can actually accept that idea, even entertain it. But if you can face it, then you can do something about it. And if there's any group that can face things, it would be engineers. We call them requirements. And if you tell us that's what we need to do, then we face it and we do our best, all right? Our next tenet is that every project includes the plans for the curtailment of fossil fuel supplies. Every project, doesn't matter what you're working on. And not least is honesty. To be honest with customers, with bosses, with policymakers, with the public, about what green technologies really are capable of doing. We have not been doing that for the last 30 years. We've been letting you think that you will be driving electric cars, that you'll have hydrogen, that uh, nuclear fusion is anything but a science experiment. We've been letting you think those things, and that's not honest. What we have to do is leave the, leave the fossil carbon in the ground, that's all. <laughs> the rest of it, whatever makes sense, will germinate and will grow but we've been distracting everyone from, from what the real problem is for, for quite a while. And maybe intentionally by some people, maybe because again, I spent quite a few years on, on hydrogen fuel cells. You put something that's hard to do in front of me and I'll get distracted. It's like a cat wiggle a string in front of them. Oh yeah, you know, we're like that. We'll work on something really hard, especially if we think it might be a good thing. 
But now we know what we have to do. We know a hard thing we have to work on that we absolutely have to do and that nobody else can do. So that's what, uh, that's what I have to say to you today. <laughs> okay.